Three recent developments motivate this presentation. First of all, we have a national government in Sri Lanka that's talking about an investment-led export strategy. Second, we have an Asian and global economy and the trade sector that's recovering from a global financial crisis rather tepidly. And third, we have protectionism exemplified by the US administration and America first. So then what is Sri Lanka's story? Where might we be in terms of our trade performance and investment performance? And where might we go? So I'm going to try to present kind of nine sets of stylized facts for your thinking um, and to sort of set the stage for this session. The first kind of fact really relates to the shift in the nature of trade and growth in the last four or five years and what might be the prognosis for the next two to three years. And what we have here is in blue trade growth and in red we have GDP growth. Okay? And we have the period just before the global financial crisis 2003 to 6 and the period after and a forecast and we have developing Asia, China and Sri Lanka. The basic takeaway from this slide is that trade growth exceeded GDP growth and the ratio was something like two in the heyday of globalization uh, in Asia. That number comes down dramatically um, after the financial crisis driven by a fall in the trade growth of China from some 18% per year, some very dizzy number to about 4%. And when you get to Sri Lanka, you see a slightly different pattern. In 2003 to 6, that ratio was 0.8. So trade growth was not as fast as GDP growth in the pre-global financial crisis period. 2003 to 2016, you see that number reaching 2.3. And then the forecast is 1.3 in 2017 to 2019. And, and that is the issue that is of concern. The nice thing is that our trade growth has been fairly fast um, in the recent period. And this is the real growth of goods and services exports, and this is IMF data. So the forecasts are that of the IMF economist, not myself. Okay? So this is, insofar as people think that the IMF is the best economics organization globally, this is what they think will be the case in a country like Sri Lanka. The second stylized fact, um, and this is where the challenges come in. So while our trade growth hasn't been so bad and we are counter-cyclical compared to the rest of Asia, what we export is challenging. And one part of it is that our export base is low and concentrated. And there has been a shift in the recent period, but it's basically tea and textiles. Services are the new factor, but we haven't really got into the global supply chain, which is a really important aspect of what we could do and what drove East Asia's success. And we have got into the IT sector, but only $900 million worth of IT exports, according to the EDB, um, possibly some 80,000 jobs, they say. Um, so there are gaps in our export basket, and the overall volume is only $17 billion. So it's very small uh, when you think of the hundreds of millions of dollars exported by Malaysia, for instance. Third stylized fact, our markets remain very much what they were at the time of liberalization in 1977. 50% of our exports goes to the EU and the US, and that hasn't changed very much. And what is missing in this is really um, Asia, and by that only 2% goes to China, very small, given the influence of China, we think, on the investment side and the projects that people were talking about. And India, which is only 6%, and typically countries trade with their geography, so you trade with your nearest neighbor a lot, not happening in the case of Sri Lanka, and then Japan, the ASEAN countries, etc., only 9%. So we are not really trading with probably the most dynamic region uh, in the world, which is Asia. And that is potentially challenging for us. People have talked about foreign investment, and this graph shows you the actual values of FDI flows for Sri Lanka, and it shows you what other people are getting in relation to gross domestic investment. And what you see is a checkered pattern. Our investment is less than a billion dollars um, as of last year, uh, FDI inflows. And in relation to our 
gross fixed capital formation, it's under 5%. You see the comparators. FDI plays a much greater role in uh, the rest of the region than in ours, and it's vital for bringing technology transfer, marketing connections, and skills, uh, which are fundamental if we want to change the structure of our economy, as the Prime Minister says, from a sort of a low-tech, commodity-dependent country to something more high-tech, medium-tech, uh, with higher skills. The things I said at the beginning with Donald Trump, a slowdown in trade, naturally have fueled export pessimism in Sri Lanka and elsewhere. How can we go forward when the rest of the region and the global market is, is um, in a difficult position? However, one should not be uh, overly pessimistic. The first is that the U.S. is still useful in our export basket in terms of a source of demand, and the U.S. is expected to grow at 2 to 2.5% this year. Um, so that important fact means there'll be demand for our exports. And so that's a key driver. The other, which is more useful, is China's rebalancing. China is going from an export-led industrial model to domestic demand and services, and this will create a whole lot of opportunities for a country like Sri Lanka, and something that we should exploit, given the Chinese presence in this economy in terms of infrastructure and tourism. There are at least four examples of things that might occur. The first is the easy bit. Some of the things China did in terms of labor-intensive exports, ranging from textiles and garments right through to electronics and eventually auto parts, uh, can well be done here through global value chains. Much of that is now in India, Indonesia, and Vietnam. We can attract some of that. A second area is as China moves up the value-added chain to more sophisticated industries, there'll be another value chain and an industrial process which we might tap into, for instance, in the IT sector. A third area is much of our exports come from large firms, small and medium enterprises not really present in our trading, and there are big opportunities for them both in manufacturing as well as the service sector, and another thing we should exploit. So there are these opportunities um, if we're able to access them properly. Now, what do we make of our trade strategy? And one of Anushka's points was that we should talk about smart trade strategy. And when you read the newspapers, you feel that everything is bad here in terms of trade and trade strategy. It's not quite true. We have some useful achievements in terms of trade agreements and in terms of getting market access. Uh, for instance, Sri Lanka did sign the uh, WTO's trade facilitation agreement, um, and that came into effect in February this year. And with the Electronic Customs, I think Sri Lanka Pay, it's called, uh, that will help reduce trade costs in the time to come, right? So something very useful and very practical uh, that government has done. A second thing that government has done is reinstate the GSP Plus, um, which gives us preferential access to the European Union market, right, for some products, but it's time-bound, right? It's time-bound till probably 2024, if I get that right. So we have a window of eight years in which to take advantage of this thing. Right? and then get on non-preferential terms, which is most likely what will happen. Uh, no amount of special pleading is going to get GSP plus renewed, perhaps, if we hit that income threshold. Um, FTAs are an emerging area, and probably the thrust is right to have FTAs with India, a more enhanced one, China, the obvious player, and Singapore, which has multiple FTAs across Asia and is very promiscuous in terms of who they trade with. Um, probably the thrust is right. Okay. However, this will take time. Okay. Um, FTA negotiations typically take three, four years, perhaps. So a start has been made, but they take time because of the complexity of the negotiations um, and the fact that we have very limited trade negotiations capacity. From what I understand of it, it's usually done by, has been done by one person trying to coordinate with different ministries. The technical work is done by the Department of Commerce. It's a very um, limited structure compared to what you have in other countries. And we may want to come back in the chat to that issue. So it'll take time by definition. However, for China, I think they will want to give us an FTA for political reasons. And we should be smart. And this is the first smart point, Anishka, to exploit that opportunity and the goodwill that they want to give us. And that's okay. Let's get China first. That will hopefully create competition for India to want to give us a deep FTA. And Singapore is doable, uh, but uh, will have some interesting challenges. The future agenda in the FTA architecture, which I think is something we could pursue, is something called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. And this is the counterpart to the 
Trans-Pacific Partnership with the United States. Um, and it involves the ASEAN countries, China, Korea, Japan, India, Australia, New Zealand, and it covers 30% of world GDP. So if we gain access to that in some way, that would be a big gain, both in terms of income gains, um, as well as the fact that RCEP is low ambition and is very development friendly. There are easier adjustment terms for the developing countries there. Um, it's lower ambition in terms of goods, services, and perhaps some investment. Um, so there are many reasons we may want to consider RCEP, and Singapore is probably our route to RCEP, and that's something we may want to exploit, uh, particularly in our bilateral relationship. Now, the first baby steps for us um, is observer status in ASEAN. And um, I learned something recently that Sri Lanka had been offered ASEAN membership way back, uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago, and we said no. Very bright spark, right? Uh, now it will be hard for us to get this in terms of observer status, and we may have to pursue this along sectoral lines, and it, again, something we may come to in the chat. But we should emphasize this thrust in our commercial diplomacy, which Foreign Minister Karunanaka has talked about, getting ASEAN membership, and we should beef up our embassy in Indonesia with an explicit mandate to try to seek some ways of having a dialogue with ASEAN. A second aspect of this is really building up our trade negotiations capacity. Trying to do multiple FTAs with a very limited team and getting into RCEP is going to be extremely challenging and something we really have to create a really good capacity if we want to do this with economists as well as lawyers and experienced negotiators. Here is a very simple story about FTA-led regionalism across Asia, and Sri Lanka has very few agreements in effect, and look at the others. Singapore, very promiscuous, 20-year agreements with virtually every partner in the world, but the real rock star is Korea. Has an agreement with the US and with the European Union. And they're very deep agreements, and they have a very sophisticated system of FTA support. They have FTA courses in 15 universities. They have set up a new institution to provide technical assistance to SMEs to make use of FTAs, and so on. I can go on about Korea as a separate lecture if I ever get invited back here. But that's the model we want to think about. Um, but Sri Lanka is a laggard in this game and a new entrant and something we've got to think about. Now, the seventh issue we've got to think about is really about deepening reforms. And they talked about this a lot. And I kind of did a very quick balance sheet for myself against some other East Asian countries and thinking about where we are on different indicators. We have achieved some things and there are areas we need to improve. In terms of tariffs, um, we haven't done so badly. 9.3% down quite a bit over the years. Um, agriculture is still heavily protected, some 20 odd percent in terms of agriculture protection, but industrial goods, um, some peaks and so on. We've got to deal with paratariffs. That number could come down to seven, probably fairly uh, short space of time. Um, ease of doing business, a big problem. Government has made a major effort on this. Eight committees, etc. e-customs. But enforcement of contracts, the legal system is up the spout in this country. It's something they've got to do about if we want to get FDI in here. You cannot solve business disputes easily here, let alone any other kind of dispute. Um, we've got to deal with the registration of property and so on. Paying taxes, they're trying to do something about. Then there is the tech bit, which we're badly on. Um, we have fewer researchers in R&D uh, than other countries. We don't have very good internet statistics. There is a problem, and I know uh, the internet is being discussed in another panel, and we don't finance our SMEs properly. Interest rates are 18%, 19%, 20%. Uh, access to credit is challenging. There are problems both on the banking system as well as on the side of the SMEs. We have to look at our collateral laws. A lot of areas we have to do. So deepening structural reforms is absolutely necessary, just as fiscal uh, issues are there. So in summary, um, I think Sri Lanka has made um, achievements um, over the years in terms of trade, uh, and trade growth isn't too bad, but there are some problems in terms of the export basket, the fact that FDI lags trade, and we, the fact that we are not trading as much with the most dynamic markets in the world. Um, going to be much harder for Sri Lanka going forward than in the past, but I'm not unduly pessimistic with the opportunities in value chain services and SMEs, and FTAs with East Asia, the bilaterals, but as well as RCEP down the track and ASEAN membership through uh, observer status and implementing reforms and infrastructure are critical. Thank you very much.